trying it. I don't, oh, she's she's well, we'll, we'll see. I don't have to <laughs> All right. I'm going to start class. Good morning, guys. It's nice to have you here. We're going to continue on with... Oh, thank you. Thanks. All of it. Thank you, Jeff. We're going to continue on with the uh, organic chemistry chapter. Uh, this chapter, uh, this week has been fraught with some fun parts, but one thing is that uh, in the old textbook, this was chapter 25, and in the new textbook, this is chapter 10. Now, I, I've done my best to change things, but there has been some hiccups this week. So if you see anything with chapter 25, uh, please let me know. I am trying, I'm in the process of trying to change it all over, so my apologies. I also sent around a new uh, what's to this week schedule because attentive students uh, saw and stuff that there were some differences, so I apologize for that. But anyway, what we'll do is we'll start in now with organic chemistry. Any questions before we get started? All right. So, uh, like we saw on Wednesday, we're entering now the area, and this is like a one-week overview of a chemistry class, which is one year long. One year long plus, technically, and it's just, it's really a, it's a big, big area. And there's no way that in basically three or so lectures that I can do justice to this huge field. So when you look at organic chemistry, it's basically about nomenclature and it's about reactivity. And nomenclature is just being able to name the many different compounds that you see, and we'll see a lot of them in this area. But there's also the area of reactivity, which is how reactions occur. Both of these are the main focus of the whole first year chemistry class. And depending on where you go and who the teacher is, you'll see different versions of both of these. We're going to focus here in this one week on the nomenclature, all right? It's really important to me that you guys listen to these names and you understand them, you recognize them. Uh, like I said, when I walked into OCHEM, uh, when I was feeling pretty cool and I'd taken the equivalent of Chem 221 to Chem 223, woohoo, I can do it! wiped out because I didn't realize that alkanes were different than alkenes and that alcohol was something that you did besides Friday night activities, shall we say. So there was lots of things that I learned immediately and, uh, and I got better throughout the year, but that first quarter was kind of a snowstorm. So my goal is just so that you won't have that experience, all right? OCHEM is kind of crazy, but I don't want it to be that crazy. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about the nomenclature, the naming of things, and then from there we'll go on into reactivity a little bit. So when it comes down to naming things, and we started this just barely on Wednesday before I had to stop, it basically comes down to a series of what they call alkyl groups. <coughs> and if you've ever had like a, a Lego set or Tinker Toys or any of these kind of things, there's always little pieces that you combine to make bigger pieces, all right? And in organic chemistry, those are called alkyl groups. So these are all small pieces that will go into maker, making bigger pieces later on. The simplest of the alkyl groups is called the methyl group. Now all of these alkyl groups are sp3 hybridized, which as a reminder just means that they're tetrahedral. They like to have four bonds. So this methyl group, three of carbon's four bonds are connected to hydrogen. All right. So that means that the methyl group is not a molecule in and of itself. That methyl group has like one piece that can stick on to something else to make a bond. So three of the four carbons, uh, three of the four slots on that carbon are filled with hydrogen, and the fourth one has room for something else. But what happens a lot is that a methyl group combines with a second sp3 hybridized carbon, so another carbon with four slots. So my methyl group had one slot, it connects to the second tetrahedral sp3 carbon. That carbon has two hydrogens. So you can imagine then that on like this end right here, there will be a slot for adding something else. So ethyl is not, once again, a compound in itself. It's a building block. And I can put a hydrogen on the end of that ethyl. I can put a chlorine on the end of that ethyl, stuff like that. But right now, these are not compounds of themselves. If you add another CH2 group now to the end of the ethyl, now you have what's called a propyl group. And the propyl group is just the next step up on this category. So again, all of these are sp3 carbons. All of them like to have four bonds. Almost all the bonds are connected with hydrogens, except for like one piece at the end. And the next one is called butyl. Butyl is just four carbons in a row. Now, what we're going to see in this section is that there's a lot of these families, all right? And families uh, type tend to behave similar uh, under certain chemical situations. 
A lot of times, capital R in organic chemistry is used as a generic alkyl group. So we'll see that uh, one class of family, which is called an alkane, is when you take an alkyl group, any kind of alkyl group, when you put a hydrogen on the end of it. So you're essentially plugging the hole, which is on the end of all of these. So if you see R, it's just like a generic term for some random type of Alkyl groups will be combined with other pieces, all right? And they will make compounds. So these are just, as I said, literally like building blocks. They aren't actually compounds in and of itself. Now, in this section, there's two things I want to point out to you that might be helpful. And the first one is what I call the Organic Chemistry Nomenclature Guide. This is in your companion, and it's also online. It's Roman numeral 2. Dash ten. If I got the room, if I got the chapters right, I think they did, but I'm not sure. Roman numeral two dash ten dash one. It's several pages, but it goes through uh, the different families and stuff like that that exist. Questions? Yeah. Um, so there's a term that we're just so there's three two three two three two three two. Um, does it keep going like that? Yes. There's a, a pentyl group which is five carbons. There's a hexyl group which is six. Heptyl is seven, octyl is eight, and stuff like that. In the um, nomenclature guide, I think it goes up to ten, which is as far as we're going to go in here. Most of the time in organic chemistry, at least in my non-organic chemistry perspective of organic chemistry, uh, ten is a high maximum. Usually it's less than that. But you could, there are names for the other ones. I don't know what they are. You don't have to do that. Other questions? So the first family that we're looking at then is called an alkane, and this is the simplest of all of the families. And to make an alkane, you take some type of alkyl group, which again is R, and you just plug it with a hydrogen. Remember, all those alkyl groups that we saw just a second ago, they have like one slot on them. And that slot needs to be filled with something to make a compound. So if you plug that hole with a hydrogen, then you'll have an alkane. That's what it is. And alkanes, uh, some of them are pretty similar, pretty familiar, probably sounding. Methane is CH4. And that methane name comes from a methyl group. We're putting a hydrogen on the end. Now, notice this stuff right here, minus YL plus A. Sometimes this works better than other times. But what it means is that a methyl group, you would take the YL off and make meth. Not that kind of meth. Don't, don't be thinking. Anyway, add A and E to it, so methane is where the name comes from. And we'll see lots of examples. Now, methane is just a CH3 in a tetrahedral environment with an H on the end of it. So methane is uh, just a methyl group plus hydrogen. So again, tetrahedral, SP3, all that kind of stuff. Methane is the main ingredient in uh, natural gas. If you go to the next ethyl alkyl group, excuse me, the next alkyl group was an ethyl group. So again, if I take the YL off and make it F and add ane, add the ane. Now, ethane is where the name comes from. So again, ethane is just a CH3, CH2 with a hydrogen on the end of it like there. So ethane is the next uh, group in this series. <coughs> smell is from a sulfur compound they, they add in. Yeah, is that correct? Right? All of these things, uh, Jackie brings up a good point, all of these natural gases are uh, pretty flammable, all right? They're, wonder they're wonderful fuels, but they do not smell. So they add compounds in then to smell. So if you smell the natural gas, you call people like Daniel to come help you out. Propane is one you've probably heard of. Propane is good for barbecue. That. Anyway, propane is just a little bit bigger than methane and ethane. And it's bigger because it takes a propyl group, and propyl was CH3, CH2, CH2, 
And again, like all alkanes, they just plug a hydrogen on the end of it. So propane is CH3, CH2, CH3 like this. Again, everything SP3 hybridized, so every carbon has four bonds to it once again. It's a good fuel and stuff like that. And then if you go on one further, you get to butane. And butane is a lot of times in cigarette lighters. You can liquefy it relatively easily. Anyway, at room temperature. So butane is a butyl group, which is a CH3, CH2, 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 with an additional hydrogen on the end of it. So you can see here then how what we're doing is we're just progressing through the different pieces. Yeah. So is it safe to say that all of these groups, as they continue on, like, are they all flammable? The alkanes, yes. Yes, I would say so. Now, it's not like I've had a lot of uh, experience with a lot of the heavier ones, but octane is another one, which is our gas, and that will be that can be cat on fire and stuff like that. So, with some reservation, I would say absolutely. Yeah. So for all the alkanes, you always add one H to the when it comes to the N. That's right. That's right. Always add one hydrogen to the alkyl group. So the alkyl groups again are kind of the building blocks and stuff. Yeah, and they're all SP3 residual. That's right, exactly. And that's really the key part here. And that's one of the reasons why we went through all this SP2, SP3, tetrahedral, blah, blah, blah. Alkanes are totally SP3. That's right. In uh, biochemical terms, it's a saturated hydrocarbon, which means that every carbon has nothing but hydrogens around it or single bonds to other carbons. The weird thing, though, when you get to butane, is that what we've drawn here is what I call a straight line of carbon. Now, straight line means more sense when you're using something like Microsoft Word. You can put CH3, CH2, CH2, CH2 with an H on it, or CH3. However, in a tetrahedral environment, it doesn't really sound as good, because these are all 109 degree angles. It's more kind of, of a jagged straight line. So bear with me if I say lines. Oh, saturated hydrocarbons, all carbon saturated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem, though, is that what we run into when we get to the four carbon alkane is that technically this crazy thing has an isomer, all right? And instead of having all four carbons in my magical chain, what you can do is take the outermost methyl group, CH3, and replace it by this hydrogen. So you're flipping the hydrogen and the methyl group. Now, what we end up with then is a type of a propane. If we were just to look at these three carbons here in the middle, excuse me, three carbons is a propyl group or propane, but we have a methyl group of the one, two, three, the second carbon. So what we start seeing right away in organic chemistry at just the fourth carbon is an isomer. And one of the things we've been talking about a lot so far in Chem 222 is this example of isomers, why they form, how they form. So these both have the same formula, all right? They're both C4H10. But the problem is, is that there's two different ways that they exist. They can exist in a straight chain, or they can exist as a methylpropane. The straight chain, sometimes you'll see this little N next to it. N uh, stands for like the normal form of the alkane, which just means everything's in a line. It's not really a, it's not really a line, it's that kind of jagged thing. <laughs> but you get the idea. So one thing we'll start seeing here is how the same formula can have many different representations. The polarity of these will be different, all right? Well, this one's kind of a jagged thing. Here we've got like methyl groups sticking off. So we start seeing changes to boiling points, melting points, even density. Is the, the isomer, is that actually artificial or is that naturally occurring? They both exist naturally. And again, I'm not an expert here, but when they start uh, taking oil and they distill off the different levels, these two will both be like part of some of the components that come off of it, yeah. But that being said, Shane, you could make some of these two if you needed to. What's the difference between boiling points, the difference? Yeah, it'll be, I, I have no idea what the boiling points are. We can look these things up, and I have books in my office. But we could look up, if we knew the name, uh, what the boiling points are. And they will be similar, Christina, but they won't be the same because of the 
a different arrangement of atoms. And that's what we're starting to look at now, is how, why, they're, why these are important and things like that that affect it. Jackie and then Marshall. The methyl propane would have a high boiling point because it takes more energy <coughs> to break the carbon. But, um, uh, I would the, say, I think it's more polar. Yeah. Well, yeah, that too. Marshall. I know that there are some isomers that naturally convert into other isomers. Right. Uh, just spontaneously, is this an example of that? Will in butane naturally convert into? All of these will have a, an activation energy, which would describe that. I do not know, honestly, what the value is and stuff here and stuff. But we could either uh, calculate it using kinetics, which is what we'll look at at the end of this quarter, or maybe look it up too. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think this one goes over naturally, but I, I could be wrong. I'll be honest. Last question, Jack. Or Abby, sorry. But you can't use like methyl propane in place of butane, like in a butane lighter. You couldn't fill it with methyl propane. It's possible that it's a mixture inside there, and I, I don't know that either. That might be an interesting engineering thing. I suspect though, because of the differences in the boiling mm. points, you might see differences. Uh, so you may have like a, a, a butane lighter that behaves differently, mm -hmm. but I'll be honest, I don't know. So, okay, I want to keep going here. I love your questions and stuff. So the next one is pentane. So if you take a pentyl group, which is five carbons, and you put a hydrogen on the end, you end up with pentane. But what we're seeing now is that we're starting to see more and more isomers. If they are in a straight line or a chain, it gets the little n in front of it. You don't always see that, but it is a nice way to know if you have just like a line of carbons or a branch system. So n-pentane would be the normal version, but you can also have two other isomers in this one. So you're seeing how as the number of atoms gets bigger and bigger, the more isomers you have. If you take one methyl off the end and you put it on one of the middle carbons, the methyl group now is right here. There's one, two, three, four, so this is a type of a butane. This is off the second <coughs> carbon. Pause on that. Five, you probably were thinking first carbon, second carbon, third carbon. All right. It looks like a three methyl butane, but the real name starts on the right and numbers to the left. So one, two, three, four. So another thing you start seeing in chemistry is that there's a difference sometimes in the numbering. This two methyl butane could also be called 3-methylbutane, all right? So another thing we're going to see here in a little bit is always look for the longest chain of carbons, like butane. And the second thing, use the smaller number, all right? Chemists are lazy, and smaller numbers must equate somehow to a laziness that I don't understand. But anyway, the smallest number and longest chain is the most important thing you guys need to learn when you're starting to know about nomenclature, all right? Yeah. You can also start at the top, right? Go yeah. The top one, down. yeah. So one, two, three, four, absolutely. This would still be a second or third methyl, right on. It doesn't matter in this case, Ryan, which way you do, but it's nice to think about these alternatives, absolutely. So Ryan brings up a good point. I drew it like this, sometimes problems will be drawn like this. Sometimes it's a good deal, though, to think about it from other perspectives. So twist it around in your mind. Do whatever you need to do. Awesome observation. The last one down here is a three-carbon chain, i.e. it's the longest uh, string of carbon atoms I can find without picking up my pencil. <laughs> All right? So if I go one, two, three, I have to pick up my pencil to go there. That doesn't Three, regardless of which way you go, is going to be like the longest chain. There are methyl groups, CH3 groups, off that longest chain. So this compound is 2,2-dimethylpropane. The numbering system will come in more in handy. Sometimes this is called just dimethylpropane, but officially here I'm going to try and give you all the right rules. 2,2-dimethylpropane. Let's go one more. Hexane is a covalently bonded molecule consisting of six carbon atoms and 14 hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom forms one covalent bond, and each carbon atom forms four covalent bonds. These 20 atoms can be rearranged into five different compounds called structural isomers, each having slightly different properties. Notice how the boiling points of each isomer changes. 
Arranging the carbon atoms in a straight chain produces N hexane. Moving the end carbon to the second carbon position and rearranging hydrogens produces 2 methyl pentane. Sliding the methyl group to the third carbon position produces 3 methyl pentane. Moving the methyl group to the fourth carbon position appears to make 4 methyl pentane. But wait! Rotating the molecule shows that it's identical to 2 methyl pentane. Now, adding the end carbon to the second carbon position produces 2,3-dimethylbutane. Moving the methyl group to the second carbon position produces 2,2-dimethylbutane. Sliding both methyl groups to the third carbon position appears to make 3,3-dimethylbutane. But wait again. Rotating the molecule shows it's identical to 2,2-dimethylbutane. These are the five isomers of hexane. So, like uh, Ryan Craig pointed out there, it's really important that you start thinking about these from many different perspectives. And just because a particular uh, group of them is shown like that, sometimes it's good to flip them around because, for example, 3,3-dimethyl uh, is the same as 2,2-dimethyl if you flip it around. So flipping is a really important thing, and seeing these in different perspectives is really good. I can't underestimate, too, again, how uh, important sometimes models will be, because sometimes if you just rotate the models, you'll see it when you didn't see it before. Why would it not be possible to take another of the, uh, the method results at the end and attach it to the one that had already been moved to the middle, and have four across and two down? Draw it. Yeah, go. Draw it. Eric, while he's drawing it. How much, how much of the needs of nomenclature do we have to, uh, uh, will be appropriate for this year's chemistry? Right on. Before you get into organic chemistry. If you look uh, uh, online, there's like an, a sample organic quiz and a sample like a video kind of thing and stuff. It's a good idea to look through those to see what's going on. I like to think of it as the simpler ones, but this stuff gets pretty crazy pretty quickly. Right. So being able to name alkanes would be a good thing to know. What? Why did they draw it? On, on your isomers, you're showing it counted over so again, the lowest number is key, and just because a picture is drawn one way doesn't mean you can't flip it around uh, to do it the other way. So it's important, Abby, that you learn that, yeah, if just because it looks like, for example, it's a 4-methyl pentane or something, if you rotate it, it would be 2-methyl. So thinking about the smallest one and flipping in your mind it is really important. All right. So going back to here then, right on, thank you. I just needed to see your picture. Yeah, sure. so, so this is a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon sig. This would be a hexane, all right? And it looks kind of like this would be an ethyl group off one, two, three, four, a butane. So it kind of looks like this is a two methyl, or excuse me, two ethyl butane. But the two things are, yeah, okay. longest chain. Longest and chain would be that it looks like an L, sort of. Longest chain is no longer in the line. Now we have one, two, three, four, five carbons in my chain. And just because it's not drawn that way doesn't mean that it's not legit. So instead of being a butane, which it looks totally like, man, you're totally right on. This is actually a pentane. This would better be called a three methyl pentane. It just shows how crazy this stuff is. Thank you for doing that. And the reason it can't be turned into a ring is because there are too many hydrogens. Right, exactly. That's right. So we'll talk about rings here in a little bit, but rings need a few less hydrogens. That's right. Good. Other questions? I, ex thank you for doing that. Okay. So there's five with hexane. There's a lot more with heptane, even more with octane, stuff like that. So when you're naming things, again, the key parts are A, longest chain, and B, smallest numbers. And that's like the mantra of organic chemistry. <coughs> So this thing right here is an example of a compound that you might want to name, all right? And it's, it is one of those ones that looks like, well, we've got like maybe three carbons here. But again, that longest chain is a, is a big part of this. So instead of thinking like this way, you have to wrap it in your mind. And remember, here's like some of the first four right here. So when you think about this one as the longest chain, when you start looking at this long enough, this is what you're going to have it. One, two, three, four, five, six. This will be a hexane. 
So the longest chain in the molecule is good. And this, in this picture, they literally drew like a box around it. And I'll be honest, guys, I do that too. All right, have some way that you can like circle the longest one, because everything in that chain will be part of the root alkane thing. So hexane in this one. So instead of having uh, different things, you're going to try to put every as much as you can in that chain. Now from there, you need to figure out the number of the pieces that aren't part of your chain. So you see right here when they circled it, there's a methyl group that was excluded. Now, there's two possibilities for numbering this one. If you start with a one here, which is legit in organic chemistry, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So this one could be a two methyl hexane or five methyl hexane. The lowest number is the way that's used. So we have a five methyl hexane would be like saying, I ain't knowing what you're doing, <laughs> all right? Like, you know what I'm saying, but that's not the way to do it. So the smallest number is really important here. If there's more than one piece that's not part of your chain, you put them in alphabetical order. So let's say we had, I don't know, an ethyl group out there or something like that. Ethyl E comes before methyl M, and methyl M would be before a propyl group. Sometimes these things will get uh, complicated very quickly. And again, but if you just break it down as you having the longest chain, that's really important. So when you look at this one long enough, you can see how the chain kind of wraps around. So it's a drag that, you know, they don't list the chain right in the middle, so it would be easy to find. Uh, either Mother Nature or Fascist Chemist, whichever term you want to use. Uh, it does not work out that way. And, oh, man. But anyway, you can see here then that this longest chain is a set of seven carbons, and a seven carbon system is a heptyl group. So heptyl as an alkane would be heptane. But what we can see now is that in this one, there's a methyl group, a second methyl group, and a third methyl group that don't belong, that aren't part of that chain. And on top of that, there's an ethyl group right there. So somehow we have to account for an ethyl and three methyls. So in Chem 221, we talked a lot about the Greek prefixes, so like dichloride, trichloride, stuff like that. We're going to use those guys here as well, but it'll be in terms of how many pieces are on it. It's like trimethyl or dimethyl, if you had three or two methyl groups. We're also going to put the numbers by them, and it's important that each of them has their own number, because you could have different combinations. So when you do this one, Ethyl group is first, it's off the third carbon, and we have methyl groups off the second, fourth, and fifth carbons. So the very best name for this molecule here then is 3-ethyl dash, 2 comma 4 comma 5 dash, trimethyl heptane. Yes? Why is the 3-ethyl first again? Cool. So if nothing else, the ethyl E comes before methyl M, so it's, it's alphabetical. Just like bromo B would come before chloro C and stuff like that. Good. And if you had, for instance, like an ethyl, a methyl, and a uh, and a butyl, <laughs> they have to be all separate. Right. That's right. They have to be separate. So butyl, ethyl, and then mm -hmm. methyl. Yeah. Right on. Good. 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 Yes. It's not in. I think they was printed. I. This is. Uh, excuse me just for a second. Ah! Oh, sorry. I had to get that out of my system, guys. I'm sorry. I've had so much fun time with the bookstore. I, I, I apologize. Um, yeah, so apparently this page is not in your notes, man. I'm sorry sorry about that. I had to just vent, man. It's been kind of one of those weeks. I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, stand it. I want to edit that out of the recording. <laughs> It's on big uh, If you uh, email me, I can send you this page as a PDF and stuff. My apologies. Is it also online? Yeah, totally. And if you can't find it, I can send it to you. So. Sorry, it's been kind of one of those. This is going on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> I would not doubt it at all. I really want to see the face of someone who's listening to this and this is like listening and like, holy crap, what just happened? Exactly, right, right, right. I know, I know, I know. It's, uh, Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> I mean, 
doing that. No, it was. <laughs> uh, so now we're going to do it. So if you can't find this page, I'll send it to you. You can copy it down, whatever. Let me know. All right. So now that we've got this kind of stuff under control, we're going to go to what Marshall said next, was about making cycle, cyclic compounds. Cyclic compounds just means you have a ring. And so rings uh, are kind of interesting. If you have an alkane and you kind of take the ends together, you have to remove some of the hydrogens, all right? Because these are all just carbon with four bonds total. So the formula will be a little bit different for these. <coughs> These are examples of different uh, alkanes that have been made into cyclic compounds. And they just have cycloalkane names. So with six carbons, this would be normally a hexane. This would be cyclohexane. In five carbons, if it was an alkane, it would be pentane. This is cyclopentane. You could have a cyclopropane, cyclobutane, etc. like that. Uh, there's two different ways that these are represented, and we talked about this a little bit during the problem set, but I want to formalize it here. We're going to see so many carbons that have hydrogens and connections to bonds that a lot of times you see these kind of shorthand notations. If you see like this little triangle, all right, ooh, cool, it's actually a purpose. This is actually a structure of cyclopropane. And what it means is that every vertice is a carbon, and carbon always has four bonds. <clears throat> so in this case, I have two bonds to other carbon. And this carbon now still needs two positions. Most of the time, hydrogen is pretty prevalent in organic chemistry. So there's two invisible hydrogens right there. So I've got carbon, 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 and two invisible CHs. So you can see the advantage of this. This is a lot easier to write when you do this over and over than having to write all these hydrogens. Double bonds, as we'll see, and all kinds of these stuff. So this and this are the same. This and this are the same. Stuff like that. So an uh, alkane, I forgot to say this on the other slide, but <coughs> an alkane has a general formula of CnH2n plus 2. So for example, methane was CH4. That means there's one carbon. So 2 times 1 <coughs> plus 2 for the alkane would be C1H4 or CH4. These are kind of generic ways to figure out formula. The difference between a cycloalkane and an alkane is that our alkanes had 2N plus 2. Cycloalkanes are just CNH2N. We're removing some of the hydrogens like Marshall has. <coughs> so if you have propane, a three carbon system, then N is three, and two times three is six. So cyclopropane would be C3H6. Again, if you, um, I'll, uh, this stuff, uh, these pieces right here are also going to be in your organic chemistry nomenclature guide, which is in the companion or online. Okay. If you take a halogen and you add it to an alkane, you end up with what's called an alkyl halide. And so a generic way of writing an alkyl halide or hyloalkane is just to take one of those alkyl groups and plug it with an X. And X is an oftentimes a term used for halogens. <coughs> so again, a reminder that halogen group is group 7A on the periodic table. It's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Astatine is way too radioactive. And honestly, fluorine doesn't show up a lot in these either, unless you're a specialist in fluorine chemistry. But chlorine, bromine, and iodine do show up a lot. So those will be the three main ones we'll see. So if you take a methyl group <coughs> and you put an iodine on the end of it, one way to call it is methyl iodide. <coughs> now, there's been a trend, though, I've noticed uh, in the last decade or so, that instead of calling it the alkyl group halogenide, or halide, all right, they usually sometimes will also put the halogen name first and then the alkane name. Mm -hmm. So this would be iodomethane. If I had a chlorine there, it would be chloromethane, stuff like that. Yeah. And both ways will show up. All right. Uh, in my inorganic world, uh, there's still a lot of the methyl iodide version, but in the organic world, there seems to be more and more of this <coughs> iodomethane. That would, would be the most common name. Yeah. Right on. So just realize that 
just like with a lot of the things we've seen in this class, which is made by humans, <laughs> all right, you're going to see variations of things. Uh, no, no. You can have, just like we saw that there were like methyl propanes and stuff like that, you can have two chloropropane kind of compounds too. So all the rules we did with numbers and longest chains still apply. Oh, that's right. I mean, uh, alcohols are the next group we're going to look at. And, uh, uh, it, you know, in my very immature days, <coughs> still there, uh, I used to think of alcohol as just something that, you know, people did when it wasn't anything. <laughs> anyway, I will be quiet on the rest of it. But technically, in science, though, alcohol is another family. So just like alkanes were an alkyl group with uh, some kind of hydrogen on the end of it, and an alkyl halide was another uh, alkyl group with a halogen on it, Alcohol is just an alkyl group with an OH on the end of it, <clears throat> all right? And by far the most common of ones that you've heard about is ethanol, all right? And this name comes from taking the YL off the alkyl group, so F, and adding anol to it. So ethanol is where this comes from, also known as ethyl alcohol and lots of other common names. So we would write this then as CH3CH2, that's the alkyl group, and the OH goes off the end of it right there, <clears throat> all right? Ethanol is also a good fuel source and stuff being explored for things. They put it in our gasoline, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Here's a generic representation for it. So uh, if you have, say, ethanol, here's the formula right here, there are two carbons, so N is two. So two times two plus two would be six, and one oxygen. So ethanol is C2, H6 and the oxygen. That's where those kind of things sometimes play out. One propanol has a propyl group, CH3, CH2, CH2, and the OH is on the end of it like there. So you can see once again the uh, propyl group, <coughs> and instead of having a hydrogen making a propane, you have an OH on the end. But please recognize that numbering system right there is important. That shows that the OH is off the first carbon <coughs> end carbon. You can also have two propanol. And two propanol, excuse me, means you have three carbons. The OH is off the middle carbon right there. <coughs> Both of these forms kind of exist. This is the isopropyl alcohol that sometimes you buy at the store for cleaning and stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, one propanol and two propanol <coughs> are both forms. There are terms like iso, tert, sec, things like that. I consider that to be kind of slang chemistry at this point, just like <laughs> ferrous and ferric. So we will not focus in this class on those terms, but they are still used a lot. I want you guys to learn the official IUPAC way, and the official way uses numbers, longest chains, stuff like that. Thanks, we're not much time on it. Good, okay, good, good, good. Jackie's taking some OCHEM, so I appreciate her input here, and stuff like that, because I always feel like, you know, I'm the metal guy in the organic area, so thank you. Sometimes people talk about the types of alcohol, <laughs> all right, and there's different reactivities you'll see. This is one of those things that, honestly, I'm not going to ask you questions on. I just want you to hear these terms. A primary alcohol means that there's an OH off of a carbon, and that carbon has one alkyl group <coughs> off of it. So notice that this OH is off this carbon. That's what the alcohol is. A primary alcohol then has one alkyl group. A secondary alcohol <coughs> has two alkyl groups off the carbon with the OH, all right? And the isopropyl or rubbing alcohol that we talked about earlier, 2-propanol is official name, that's a secondary alcohol. You can also have what's called a tertiary alcohol, where that carbon has not one, not two, but actually three alkyl groups. In organic chemistry, this becomes kind of important. Mm -hmm. What about methanol? Methanol would be just an example of like a base and stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. It, it doesn't have the extra carbon off the end. So uh, so like be, right, it base. would be closer to a primary, right, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does the OH group make it an yeah. acid? OH makes it an alcohol. Yeah, OH is an alcohol. Now, we'll talk more about acids uh, more next quarter, all right? But for here, just realize that <laughs> this is this family, and they all behave in a similar fashion. Alcohols make it a base. Alcohols make it a base. A little bit more. Yeah. We'll talk more about this stuff later. Roman. Uh, if you would put something like this in water, would it dissociate? Uh, this thing uh, would uh, probably dissolve, but it wouldn't probably <coughs> dissociate. And we'll talk more about when things dissolve and not uh, in a little bit in this quarter. Last question. Now, the R you said is the alkyl group? Yes. So could you draw on the board like what the primary would look like with an alkyl group on it? So I'm having a hard time seeing yeah. right. Oh, right on. <coughs> this is the primary right here, which is... So the that would take place with the R? Yeah. Okay. This CH3 is the R, all right? 
some of the people that have come back and told me about their experiences at organic chemistry have told me this was an important thing to talk about. No, so, it is. I am trying to do justice to them, but honestly, I'm not going to ask you guys questions like, is this secondary or primary mm -hmm. alcohol? No, Glycols are double alcohols or a diol. So di just means two. <coughs> and once in a while, they show up. So ethylene glycol <coughs> is uh, just an ethyl group, all right? But there are two OHs off it. So ethylene glycol is 1,2-ethane diol. Propylene glycol is 1,2-propane diol. So the name ethane would be what this would be if it was an alkane, but it's a di-oxidized <coughs> like dibromo and stuff like that. We have two alcohol groups. In this case, it's a 1,2-ethane diol. Propylene glycol is 1,2-propane diol. So if you hear about these kind of terms, just remember your Greek prefixes, all right? Di means two. Tri would be three, all right? All these kind of things still apply. Glycerol has 1,2,3 OHs off of it. Glycerol is 1,2,3-propane <coughs> triol. So again, what we're seeing here is like we saw in Chem 221, a lot of things have a common name, and then they have like an official uh, approved name. Glycerol would be the unofficial name, like water is supposed to be dihydrogen monoxide. The IL would be the uh, name. Yes, and listening for that all ending will give you a hint as if it's an alcohol. So you can turn any of the alkanes into alcohols basically by ripping hydrogen off the ends and taking out the that's right, exactly, that's right. And it, specifically an alcohol would be an OH, because there's other types of oxygen things we'll do here. Well, uh, there's a connection with my glycogen. Does that have to do anything with sugars? I don't know. If you want. Don't know. Glycogen. Ethers is another example of an oxygen-containing species. It's kind of like an alcohol, like what uh, Marshall asked, but it's a little bit different. Instead of having an OH group, what you have here are two alkyl groups, one on each side of oxygen. So we've talked a lot about this week how oxygen likes to have two bonds and two lone pairs. It makes the formal charges go to zero. This oxygen is one of those. It has two single bonds. There's a lone pair coming out of the screen and one going into the screen. This compound right here is diethyl ether. All right? It has two ethyl groups. And each ethyl group is connected, if you will, by an oxygen in the middle. <coughs> Ethers are really good solvents. Uh, these is now a controlled substance because of DEA intervention and the making of meth and stuff like that. It used to be a lot easier to buy diethyl ether, and now it's really hard. I like diethyl ether because in the old train, black and white train robbery movies, the bad guy would come up behind someone and put this bag. Oh, it's chloroform. Kind of like it's a di it's another alternative to chloroform, right? Right? right. So anyway, it's a knockout thing. These are the dumb things that I pay attention to. But anyway, a d an ether then is just another combination where you have an oxygen, but now you have an alkyl group on both sides. So the classic way of naming these things is just uh, some kind of a prefix with the alkyl name and then ether on the end. But another thing that's happened since I started to teach it is that ethers have a more official name that I need to talk about. And this is the official way to name an ether. So what they do is they use the longest chain alkane name, and then they give the alkyl group an oxy ending. So that probably made about as much sense as uh, most of my Arabic speaking. So let's look at this compound right here. One, two, three carbons is longer than one, two carbons. So if this was an alkane, this would be propane. Propyl group turned into an alkane would be propane. This is an ethyl group, <coughs> all right? So instead of this being like an ethyl propane, there's an oxygen in the middle of it. So this compound is an ethoxy group, all right? The O on the end of the ethyl group turns an ethyl into an ethoxy. This is off the first of my three carbons. So this one is best called one ethoxy propane. You could have the same ethoxy group coming off the middle carbon. That would be a 2-ethoxy propane. So the numbers become pretty important. This guy down here, if you look at it, there's one, two, three carbons. It's harder to write in Microsoft Word, but this is what you'll see. 
and the meth oxy group is off the second carbon. So this would be a two methoxy <coughs> because the oxygen is connected to the smaller alkyl, and then one, two, three propane. I agree with that. <laughs> right on. That was common name when I. Awesome. Right on. See, I was. So you're going to see. Two was confusing. <laughs> see, agree. There's two different ways to name these crazy things, and it's just really important that you hear them both right now, and then you can kind of fine tune stuff. Come draw it. <laughs> I'll be honest, guys. I don't see these things real well in my mind. It's, it helps me to see them, and that's why I'm always writing things on my hand, my Palm Pilot and stuff. So thank you, Daniel, for being um, uh, silly here. So. <laughs> now a little tidbit. Uh, ether has been supposed to be the, the great oracle of Delphi. Yeah. Was, yes. Uh, the oracle that. was from the ether that was seeping it up would be the ground where the, where the monastery was. <laughs> So that what has produced her, uh, her great oracles. Better living through chemistry. You can do that. It would be called a um, tertiary. It would be called a. It kind of does like it's called like tertiary. Oh, it's not to be right here. What's wrong with this structure? <laughs> it's it's bonds too high. Yeah, too many bonds around your oxygen, man. So oxygen almost always just wants two single bonds and two lone pairs. If this was carbon, it would be no problem, but having an oxygen in the middle would be uh, really bad, like formal <coughs> charge-wise and stuff like that. So oxygen really only likes to make two bonds and two lone pairs. That's why this would be, uh, this would be a pretty unstable molecule. You can make it so, good. so all of these things that we're seeing in the last two chapters are still going to be here, man. It's just a different way of seeing. <laughs> yes, so, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. I'm still thinking other life forms. There's more than just uh, ethers when it comes to oxygen, and, and uh, there's more than ethers and alcohols for oxygen. And one of the ones we'll see a lot is what's called a ketone. <coughs> now, there's a C double bond O that shows up a lot. So again, going back to the idea that oxygen likes to make two bonds and have two lone pairs, a real common way is to use what's called a carbonyl. And in organic chemistry, a carbonyl is a term for a carbon-oxygen double bond. So as an example of this, CH3, C double bond O, CH3, here's this carbonyl. Now, if this carbonyl has alkyl groups on both sides of it, and that's really important, so a carbonyl with alkyl groups on both sides, that's what makes a ketone. We're going to see if you have a hydrogen or other things over here, it's a different kind of family. So a ketone has alkyl groups on both sides. So one, two, three carbons would be propane if it was an alkane. But because this is a ketone, it gets this cool own ending. So you take the E off and you add own to it, so propanone. Propanone has a very common name, which is acetone. So sometimes in lab, we've used propanone to dry glassware and stuff like that. You now know what the formula is. Woohoo! This one you can still buy at Fred Meyer's. Ketones make um, things, uh, they're melting points a lot lower. And they make your incense sometimes smell good. Gotcha. We're, we're out of time, guys. Have a great weekend. We will do more of this on Monday. Have a good day. If I interject too much, just tell me to No, you don't. You're fine. I, talk, I like have a sheet of uh, paper that were all of them showing, like, in the notes. Yeah. So, Roman numeral 2 dash Did you say it? Dash. I think I missed it. Oh, yeah. If you have your companion, I can show you real fast and stuff. So. I like that ether because she showed us how to do that ether. Yeah. A sheet of paper. I took 103. Uh-huh. Um.